Our scripture passage is today is from the revelation given to St. John, chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. Before we read this, let us pause for a moment in prayer. Gracious and heavenly Father, we come today with thanksgiving before the word that you have given us, knowing that you have given us this word to teach us, to guide us, to instruct us, to show us the way to remind us of your great promises that you have made to all your children. But Father, we also know we can understand none of these things unless the same Spirit that illuminated these words would illuminate our hearts and minds. So send that Spirit to us, we pray, into our hearts and minds that we may hear, that we may read, and that we may understand. Lord, bless this holy reading of your holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is the revelation given to John, chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. Listen now to the word of the Lord. And a great sun appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in the heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O sea, earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think a lot of you by now know that I'm a little bit of a history buff. That I love to to read history and to study history. And and I talk about it quite a bit in my sermons. And today's no different. But before I do that, I want to test you out a little bit to see how well you know your history. Okay, I'm going to throw out some dates to you. And I want to see if you can tell me what is significant about that date. Okay. I'll start out easy. All right. 1776. What, what, what happened that day, Yana? What would you all say? I couldn't hear. <laughs> yeah, the Declaration of Independence was signed. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. We'll, we'll start another easy one here. What about 1492? Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Somebody remembers their rhyme from school. Well, good. Columbus, yeah, Columbus's voyage, 1492. Now, here's a little one a little bit harder. 44 B.C. Somebody know what's significant about 44 B.C.? That was the assassination of Julius Caesar. Happened in 44 B.C. on the Ides of March. Yeah, somebody remember your Shakespeare, the Ides of March. Here's one you probably haven't heard. 
1271. Anybody any idea what happened on 1271? 1271 was the fall of the last crusader stronghold in Israel. It was the effective end. It wasn't the end of the crusades, but the effective end of the crusades. And if you do remember from history, the crusades were an attempt from the European powers to take Jerusalem out of the hands of Muslims and to hold it in, in, a, in Christian power. And for over 100 years, they were successful. They, they, they took over Jerusalem, and they had what they called these, the crusader states, or these Christian kingdoms in the area that they called the Levant. And so for over 100 years, they were these, these Christian, this Christian kingdom in the Middle East and over Jerusalem. But slowly over time, as enthusiasm for the Crusades weighed, the Muslims started taking back over, and they lost more and more and more until finally in 1271, the city of Acre fell, and there was only one castle left in the Crusaders' hands. And that was the quite imposing structure, a castle called Croc de Chevalier. It was this huge castle. It was held by these knights called the Knights Hospitallers, or the Knights of the Hospital. And it was considered an impregnable fortress. And you had this one little castle surrounded by enemies all around, supposedly being, not being able to be taken, except that it was taken. The castle was taken because the knights received a letter from their grandmaster telling them to surrender the castle. Only the, the letter was a forgery. It was a clever forgery given to the knights, and after ten days of siege, they gave up without a fight. And Croc de Chevalier, the last Christian stronghold in the Levant, had fallen. And the only reason it was fallen, because the knights inside were made to think that they were no longer at war. And I say this because it is a great analogy. It's a great analogy for a church. Here you have this, this castle, this stronghold, surrounded by enemies. And the only way that this castle can fall is if the men and women, the defenders inside, quit fighting. And that's an analogy I say as has for the church. The church in the world is, is that the church is this little stronghold in the world and it is surrounded by enemies. Surrounded by enemies that want to see the church destroyed, want to see the work of Christ destroyed, everything we stand for thrown down and trampled to the ground. And here we are, this little church surrounded by a sea of enemies. But like that castle of Croc de Chevalier, the only way we can be destroyed as if we give up. No matter how great and strong the powers of the world are, the only way that they can destroy the church is if we forget somehow that we are at war and no longer wage the battle. A reading in Revelation today is a very vivid reading. It gives us this stark image of this woman and a dragon. All of it you can read through chapter and chapter 12. I didn't read the whole thing. There's, there's a little more to the story. But the whole, this whole series in chapter 12 is a story that says a woman and a dragon, this vision that St. John saw. And, and the woman and the dragon are both symbols. They're not a literal woman and a literal dragon. They're, they're, they're symbols that, uh, that John sees to represent this war of the church against the world. Now, to understand this, we have to understand these two symbols, the woman and the dragon. Now, the dragon, it tells us exactly who that is. It tells us in, 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 this, in this reading who the dragon is. The dragon is Satan, this dragon with, with seven heads and ten horns and these seven diadems. The seven-headed dragon is Satan. Now, he needs no introduction. Right? We're, we're very familiar with him. And it tells us he's the accusers of our brothers. He's the great tempter. He's the one trying to destroy the good work of God. And accuse the saints before the throne of God, it says, day and night. So him we know. Now the woman, it doesn't tell us exactly who this woman is. It says that she is clothed with the sun, she has the moon at her feet, and on her head is a crown with, uh, with, with, seven, with sorry, 12 stars in her crown. Now I think this woman in here is the church. I think the symbol of the woman represents the church. And, and uh, th there's a long tradition of talking about the church in feminine terms. The church has always been described as a woman. 
uh, in, the, in the Bible, she's talking about as the bride of Christ. And throughout history, uh, Christians have referred to the church as Mother Church. So we have a long tradition of, of talking about the church in, in feminine terms. But I think there's more evidence in this passage to let us know that the woman here is, in fact, the church. Um, there's two instances where it talks about her children. And the first one is verse 2, where she's giving birth. And we'll get back to get that in a minute. Uh, but later on in verse 17, it says that she has many children. And her children are those who keep the commands of God and they keep to the testimony of Jesus. The children of the woman, those who keep the commands of God and keep the testimony of Jesus Christ. Does that sound like anybody you know? That's us. That's me. That's you. That's all Christians, all believers, in every time and place. People who keep the commands of God and they keep to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those are the children of this woman. That is the children of the church. The woman here in this image in Revelation is the church. The sun represents the great radiance and the glory of the church. The moon under her feet shows that she can give light and guidance whether it's day or whether it's night. The 12 stars in her crown represent the 12 tribes of Israel of which you and I, all believers, are members. Now when we meet this woman, it says she is giving birth, she's pregnant, and she is crying out with the pains of childbirth. And she's about to give birth to a male child, it says a male child who is going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Now most of the commentators, commenters I read, um, they take this male child to be Christ. They said that this male child is Christ, which means the woman is not really the church, but she is Mary. And a good argument is made for that. A good argument is made for this, this child ruling with the rod of iron is Jesus and the woman is Mary. But the reason I don't think that this is the case is because the story played out here sounds to me to be a very different story than the story of Jesus. The way they interpret is that the woman is giving birth, right? And so we got the story, got this big dragon and he's, and he's, he's looming over the woman. And he's waiting for her to give birth to this child so he can devour the child. And a lot of the, the, the commentaries will say that the, the this, this dragon devouring is the, the story of Herod when he was in Bethlehem. And he killed every male child that was born around the time of Christ. And then that God taking the child up into heaven is, is the ascension of Christ after his death and after his resurrection. And all that happens here is a symbol of Christ's ministry. Christ waiting to be devoured by, by the dragon, but then eventually ascending into heaven. Here's the problem I have with that. Is that doesn't sound like the story of Jesus. That doesn't sound like the story of the Christ that I know. In the story of the Christ that I know, Jesus did not have to be saved from the serpent. Jesus didn't have to be rescued from the serpent and taken up to heaven. In the story of Jesus I know, Christ went head to head with the serpent. Christ fought the serpent in temptation. He fought the serpent on the cross. He fought the serpent by conquering death. And the story I know, Jesus wasn't speared away to safety. Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. This story, I believe, is the story of the church. The woman is the church, and she's about to give birth to a child that's going to reign and rule the nations with a rod of iron. And the child she's giving birth to is the destiny of the church. The destiny of the church to rule the world in what they call the millennium. The thousand year reign of Christ. I'm not going to talk a lot about the millennium right now. That's going to come much later in our story. But it's already we have a precursor. We're already we have the hints of it. Here the woman is giving birth to a child. She's giving birth to the destiny of the church to reign in power one day. And there is Satan. There is the great dragon ready to devour it. Ready to stop this from happening. Ready to prevent the church from realizing its fullness and its destiny to reign with Christ. With his elders for a thousand years. But it's not the time yet. It's not the time yet. She's about to give birth to it, but it's not the time for the church to reign. So God takes this and he protects the destiny. He protects the fate of the church. 
and he holds it until the time is near and the fullness of history has arrived. It is not yet time for the church to reign. That day is coming, but not today. Now the woman in the church and the reign and the, and, and the child with the, who's going to rule with the rod of iron, that's not of immediate concern to us. That, that is concern to us. It's, it's a future concern. That, that's a hope and that's a promise that we look forward to. Our immediate concern is the conflict between the woman and the dragon, which we know is the conflict between Satan and the church. And in this vision John has, there is this great conflict between Satan and the church. There is this, this time when the church is going to be persecuted. They call it the great persecution of the great tribulation. And the church waits with dread. But we also must know that today is just as dangerous as the time of the great persecution. It may not be great as compared to what might be coming, but today... Today, where we live is we live in the reign of the world. We live in a time that Jesus called the time of the Gentiles. Now, this might not come as a surprise to you, but it's not the righteous who rule the world. It is not the righteous who are reigning in our world today. It is not the righteous, it's not the good, it's not the godly that have control of our world today today. Who has control of our world today is what we call the powers of the world. See, in this story, there comes a time where, where Satan is cast out of heaven. And when he is cast out of heaven, he loses almost all of his authority to influence the world and to influence events. But that time is not yet here. We are still living in this time where Satan still has a great deal of authority over this world. And we forget that sometimes. We forget that today we are like that little castle. We are an outpost in a dangerous world. And while we are that little castle that we are being laid siege to and we are being attacked by temptation and evil and all these forces out to seek to destroy the church. And we know at some point in the future this war in heaven is going to culminate and Michael is going to defeat Satan. He's going to cast him out and his power in heaven is going to be broken. Unfortunately, that means he has now been cast to earth and he begins the great persecution. Until that day comes, the powers of evil have a great deal of authority over this world. And we as God's people have to learn to live and strive to be righteous, strive to be God's people. We have to strive to be children of Mother Church until that kingdom arrives. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. I know some of you are thinking that I'm sounding a little bit fanatical right now. I mean, and maybe I, I need a podcast where I've got this conspiracy, these dark powers taking over the world. And, and, and you might even be thinking about a podcast you've heard before, like, man, he sounds like him. He's gone off the deep end. I know what it sounds like. I know. But I also know that we have been really, really blessed to live in the time that we live right now. As, as, as members of Christ church and as just citizens on earth, we are very blessed to live in a time where, where the church enjoys freedom, where we enjoy prosperity, where for the most part we are not subject to persecution. And there's even been times recently in our history where we could say that we have lived in a Christian nation. It has been good times. But it's been so good that many of us have forgotten that we are a church at war. Many of us have forgotten that there is an enemy out there that wants to destroy us. There's a movie, I don't know if you've uh, ever seen The Usual Suspects, Kevin Spacey. Wonderful movie. I won't ruin the end for you. But I will tell you one of the greatest lines I heard in there. He said, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was making people think he didn't exist. We're still a castle surrounded by enemies in hostile territory. Now, you don't have to take my word for this. 
You don't have to take my word at all. You can take the word of Jesus for this. Now, I want to take you back to a story early in his ministry, the temptation of Christ. When, when he goes head to head with the devil. And Satan is trying to tempt Christ. And he uses all these methods of tempting him. And he finally takes him up to a mountain. And it says he's up in a mountain and he sees all the kingdoms of the world. Okay, All the kingdoms of the world are seen by Satan and Jesus. And Satan says, if you'll worship me, I will give you all these kingdoms. Now, of course, Satan doesn't follow the temptation. He answers with, you should only worship the Lord thy God. But I want you to notice how, Satan, how Jesus doesn't answer Satan. Never once in that, in that uh, exchange did Jesus say, wait a minute, you don't own these cities. You can't give me what's not yours. Never once when Satan claims to have the authority over all these cities and all the nations of the world, nowhere does, does, does Jesus say, wait, wait, you don't have the authority over that. And he doesn't contradict them because Jesus knows. For a time, Satan does have authority over the powers of the world. And he has that authority still. But you can even see for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it at all. You can ask yourself. Do it honestly. What are the values of our world? Look at our world with a critical eye. The movies, the music, our commercials, the values that we promote in public. What are the values of the world? Are these the values of Christ? Are these the values of the church? Are they values of something else altogether? In the values of the world, it's the self that's the center. It's the self that is chief among all, and that's, and that's the virtue or, or rather the sin of pride. In the values of the world, it's all about being happy. It's all about satisfying yourself. And, and from there come all the values of the world like greed and ambition and power and lust and fame and desire for popularity was just another form of self-glorification. And out of these values come the terrible results of the world, rivalry, deceit, slander, factions, intolerance, anger, hatred, violence, war, exploitation of other people. These are the things the world stands for. These are the things that the world produces, and these are not the values of the church. And these are not the things Christ stands for, and these are not the things that God stands for, and these are not the things that we fight and live for. In serving God, we do not serve the self. We do not glorify the self. We are here to serve God, to serve Christ, and we are here to serve other people. It's not pride that we operate out of or should, but faith. And out of these come the values of the church, values like charity and humility, values like obedience and self-control and love and discipline and forgiveness and kindness and gentleness and courage and endurance. And these values produce vastly different results as the church fights to establish joy and peace and hope and love and goodness and righteousness and justice and fairness across the world. If we're honest with ourselves, the values of the world and the values of the church are not just different, they are at war with one another. Now, I don't say this to scare anybody. I don't want to say this to try to be scary. We've got this big, angry dragon. He's looking to devour the church. But, you know, Revelation's a scary book. If I didn't let some of the terror bleed into it, I would not be representing this book faithfully. It's a scary book. And it's scary to know that we're surrounded by enemies. It's scary to know that we're this one little outpost in enemy territory. But I don't say this to scare you. I say this so that you would be wary, that you would be cautious, that you would not let your guard down and allow yourself to be deceived by the lies of a deceitful world. The church and the world have different goals. The church and the world have different values. The church and the world fight for different outcomes. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and mammon. And mammon, he meant worldly wealth and worldly pursuits. He says you can't serve one 
and serve the other at the same time. Because you'll love one and hate the other. The world's a very powerful place. And it can be a very scary place as well to think we are that little church, that little castle surrounded by enemies. But the promise of God is that you do not have to be afraid. In the story, you have the ultimate underdog, a woman being pursued by a dragon with seven heads. But the woman perseveres. The dragon tries to chase the woman down, but, but, but God takes the woman and sets her in the wilderness where she is kept for a period of time. Then the dragon opens his mouth and, and tries to, to, a great water comes out and tries to wash the woman away. But the earth itself opens up this great chasm and swallows up the water. You see, God will protect his church. God will see that his bride, it belongs to him and lasts until the very end. And we will face tribulation. We will face violence, we'll face oppression, we'll face all sorts of temptations, and some of us will even face death. But we will persevere. I want to throw one more date out to you that you may or may have heard of. 1565. There was another castle surrounded by another horde of enemies. It was the castle of a Fort St. Angelo in Malta. And it was the Knights Hospitallers once again. And they were being laid siege to by the great Ottoman Empire and by the ruler known as Suleiman the Great. But this time the result was different. This time the defenders did not give up. And 600 knights with another 1,500 auxiliary soldiers, held the fort of San Angelo for 40 days against 40,000 Ottoman troops and siege engines and cannon fire. But they never gave up. At one point, a big wall, a hole in the wall was made by cannon fire, and the 70-year-old grandmaster of the Knights Hospitallers named De Valette stood in the breach himself and fought for seven hours, holding off enemies. That castle was never taken. See, like that castle, we can't be taken unless we forget that we are at war. Christ will preserve you. Christ will defend you. The only way for you to lose is to give up. The only way for you to lose is to forget that we are at war. To take up the battle in faith, that is how you conquer. Not by your might, but in the power of Christ that works through you. That works through his people. That works through the children of Mother Church. By your faith, by your hope, by your love, you will persevere. And in persevering, you will behold the glory of God's kingdom. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen.